Dude, I'm a patriot. What Don't call me, dude. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna call you, dude. I'm gonna call you. Anything. Actually, I'm gonna call you, dude. Hey, oh, man. Shut up. Give me a call. Give me such a So, I'm a patriot. And what patriots do not do is defend the indefensible of their country. I was an opponent of the Iraq War. I do not. I, I did not support the surge. Excuse me. I wrote a cookbook making fun of President Bush because I opposed the Iraq War, and both of my brothers served. So, uh, sorry. Just save your book, Voss. So I, I completely objected to. I completely objected to the Iraq War, and I object to our policy in Afghanistan, principally because we are fighting a war with you as a partner. It's like putting a priest in charge of daycare. Now, your figures, by the way, are completely fictional, and all of any of you can actually go to the. Um, to the Congressional Research Service. You can also go to the USA Green Book and get the real numbers for yourself. This is from the ISI Magical Mystery Number Generator. All right? So I don't think I need to say anything because you were speechifying. But I'm going to tell you, since you raised the issue of Afghanistan, sir, and I'm so glad you did because this is one of my favorite topics. Your country began interfering in Afghanistan actually in the late 1950s. You, under Zul your government, not you, of course, because you weren't probably even a, a fetus then, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in 1974 began the Afghan Jihad. He is the one that set up the ISI cell. And pumped it. Excuse me? Yeah, you oh, well, okay, you also can't do math. In addition to lying about your ethnicity, you're also mathematically challenged. Um, President Carter sanctioned Pakistan in April of 1979 for violations of the Glenn Symington Act. We did not begin funding, and this, I will also say, was a very big mistake. The United States began funding your jihad, sir, in 1982. If you can do the math, that means that you were doing this on your own time and you're on time between 74 to 19, excuse me, 82. I teach this, you don't, oh, okay? So now, if you're gonna ask me if that was a very bad decision, I've never defended the decision. And in fact, as a feminist, I think it was outrageous that we, in fact, sided on the war with people that think women should be, uh, you know, uh, running around in a shuttlecock. It was a complete fiasco. <laughs> and moreover, that also gave rise to Al-Qaeda. So I'm, unlike, unlike these fake Pakistani patriots who feel the need to make excuses and lie about the predations of their country, I own the mistakes of my country and I don't defend them. And I also don't feel to take dictation from my military attache um, in my embassy. I, I am completely free to say whatever I want. And that's why I can be very anti-American in many ways, but still also narrowly support the drone program. And I'm happy to have a discussion with you about that offline yes. if you're going to promise to not lie yes. about your Pashtun identity. My, 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 my cousins work here. Generally, human beings believe human born uh, sinner. But unfortunately, Pakistan and Pakistani born innocent. They think everything happened outside there. They have no fault in it. They are they're born innocent. Mubarako. Uh, OK. Uh, the question, my question is, uh, ever Pakistan has been ruled by the rule of law since the Pakistan created in the name of the, that's prejudice in the name of Islam? Uh, can, can, can Pakistani institution... Can we ask one of the panel to yeah, answer? Yeah, I would like to add one question to it, please. Quickly. Can Pakistani institution be reformed to the level in which Pakistan can function as a normal state from where one should start this reform? Thank you. Like Dr. Sheikh mentioned Aids as, as, an, as a thinking Pakistani sometime in her presentation. Prior to that, might I invoke the memory of 70 years on of Justice Mohammed Munir and the Munir Commission report, wherein it was pointed out, as you asked for the ideology of the state, and Justice Munir was left stunned after interviewing Shia and Sunni divines, not any of which could come to the definition of Islam. And as he pointed out in the conclusion of his Blue Paper Report of 1954, that this is a harbinger of things to come, and it's not exactly a very good way of going about. And later in his 1978 book, Justice Munir mentioned, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, in the late 60s, uh, when he was talking as things were deteriorating in the Eastern Wing, an East Pakistani, Sunni Bengali, turned around to him and in conversation mentioned to him, uh, well, yes, if things go bad, why don't you go on your own way and we go our way? Idhar ham, udhar tum, as Zulfikar Ali Bhutto once said. And this was the gem of it, Christine, what uh, the East Pakistani said to him, we will continue being Pakistan, you be what you want, because after all, we were the majority in 46 who voted for it.
My question is to Dr. Fair is, what do you see the role of democracy in the newly formed Milli Muslim League in the Republic of Pakistan? Thank you very much. So in some sense, this is surprising, right? Because um, Lashkar Tayyaba, there's a debate within um, Salafis, you know, Gherm Khalid, about whether or not one should participate in democracy or not. And for the longest time, um, Lashkar Tayyaba had been of the view that they shouldn't be participating in democracy. And in fact, they have, I mean, thousands of pages where they're basically talking about this non-political role that they believe um, they should play. And of course, no one ever reads this stuff. So no one ever is going to say to Hafiz Saeed, hey, dude, you know, how do you sort of justify <laughs> retrenching from 20 years of, of your position? But I, I think one of, the, one of the reasons why this is an important move is that most people, when they talk about Lashkar Taiba, think about the external utility, that they are basically um, a very resilient and a very pliant proxy that kills at the behest of the deep state. And so they're very reliable uh, to kill in India and in, in, in their last decade or so also in Afghanistan. But what few people actually pay attention to is that they're the only organization within Pakistan which advocates against sectarian violence. They are militantly anti-Takfir and, and there's these great micturation matches between them and, and those that, that uh, practice Takfir. Um, they're also against communal violence. So while they talk about slaughtering the Kufar in India and in America, uh, they actually are of the position that the Kufar should actually be proselytized through through uh, Dawa. And you see them doing this in Sindh, where, of course, you have a very large Hindu population. So the LET and JUD are very close partners with the ISI, not only because of the external objectives of the state, but also because of the internal politics. So in some sense, while it's unexpected, if you take them at their word, that they would be extending into a political party, it's actually a very natural extension from all of the domestic work that they've been doing, first through JUD and FIF. And there's this really funny speech where, uh, in fact, the rebranding of LET as JUD and FIF have been so successful that Hafiz Saeed had to remark of some of the outreach that was happening and send, oh my gosh, we're actually doing this. Don't forget, it's us doing it. It's not a separate organization. So I think this is uh, really a culmination of the domestic work that they've done under the guises of JUD and FIF. Last Thursday, 10th August, BBC World Service's Owen Bennett Jones delved into the lives of Pakistani Hindus, one of the more revealing broadcasts among several during a season of partisan programs. Listening as an Orientalist, I presently noted it was aired a day before what is now, uncomfortably for Pakistani officialdom, Jinnah's declarative of August 11, 1947, that your religion has nothing to do with the business of the state. Pakistani parliamentarian and president of the Hindu Council, Dr. Ramesh Vankwani, would beg to differ. He stated, I can't move without security. If I'm going to Islamabad, I will book my ticket in three flights, and in which flight I'm going, I can't tell anything, not even to the driver. Close quote. Vankwani might spare a thought for Pakistani Jewry, all of whom dissimulate Takiya in Shia speak as either Parsis or Christians, a situation unobtainable anywhere, in, even in the Arab world, where Functioning synagogues still exist for precariously tiny communities in Beirut, Cairo, and Baghdad, and elsewhere, even as Israel, like Pakistan, turns 70 next year. It affords you a grim understanding of the theme of the seminar, the deep state and its hateful proxies, seven decades on. I also recall Yazia ul Haq, who disappeared into fire, ash, and mangoes this very afternoon, August 17, 29 years ago. Exactly a month earlier, July 17, 1988, on Zia's orders, Karachi's Magin Shalom Synagogue was razed to the ground for a shopping plaza. As local historian Gul Hassan Kalmati lamented, Jews built Karachi while we destroyed. Flagstaff House, Karachi residence of the Governor General, was designed by that Pune born Jew and Lahoreite, Moses Joseph Somake. Jinnah had purchased it in 1944 from local Parsi magnate Sir Kavasji Kathrak. Small wonder such dealings and his lifestyle led Maulana Mazar Ali Azhar to parody him as kafir azam His and Ataullah Shah Bukhari's majlis e ahrarul islam routinely heaped opprobrium on the All India Muslim League's plans to create a Palidistan, land of the polluted, Palidkardan from Persian, the verbal infinitive, and Khakistan, land of dust. Ramat Ali, that cantankerous Cambridge alumnus, 
to whom the acronym Pakistan owes its inception died in 51, but not before dismissing Jinnah as a quizzling Yazam, a far more uncharitable depiction given its Nazi overtones only two years after the war. Both Jinnah and his successor Liaqat Ali Khan, quote, would have been bumped off, close quote, in the words of Rana Khan, his widow. She candidly declared in an interview with the Herald, October 1984, that their honesty would never have been tolerated. She reminisced being threatened too for not giving up her demands to uncover the conspiracy behind the assassination of the first prime minister. Pakistan may not quite be Khakistan. Khoklastan, land of the hollow, is more like it. For Ashley Tellis points out how Pakistan is well on its way to becoming an increasingly hollowed state. Its depraved insistence on parity with India, a confection of wounded Muslim hubris, self-pity, rage and ferocity, which clamors for recognition out of proportion with its standing and strength. Why? Because Farzana Sheikh tellingly summed it up in her 1990 dissertation at Columbia that an essential part of being Muslim was predicated on their preeminent claim to power, which flowed from the experience of Muslim dominance. Khokla, in Pakistan's national language Urdu, carries far more punch than its English equivalent hollow. A moral and political void then is evinced as the Pakistani deep state goes about brutally suppressing an insurgency in its largest, least populated and most impoverished province, Balochistan. As other outliers across the subcontinent, its denizens have felt ambivalent about belonging. As The Economist's July 22nd special report on India and Pakistan last month stated, quote, whereas India's men in uniform face intense scrutiny in Kashmir, Pakistan enjoys a far freer hand close quote, decimating whole villages across the NWFP and Balochistan, a province in sporadic revolt since independence. The deep state's policy of pick up and dump routine leads to a situation unparalleled anywhere, except perhaps Syria perhaps, where distraught relatives discover mutilated corpses by roadsides stuffed with feces in their mouth. Bengalis as former East Pakistanis were Sunni Hanafis like Baluchis, but even they did not have to endure this. The stunning silence of Pakistanis, where all Muslims for that matter, vindicates the sordid truism that they are selectively animated by outrages visited upon Muslims. Palestinians and Kashmiris during the last 70 years have never reported anything so repulsive about Indian and Israeli, namely non-Muslim security forces. Islamabad, for instance, would never chastise Beijing for prohibiting Uyghur Muslim university students and civil service officials from fasting during Ramadan. Not a pipsqueak from the rest of the Islamic world as well. Or Pakistan's leading English broadcast, whose leader on the 14th August dawn said, the geographically largest, least populated, most heavily military pro pro province in the country, Baluchistan, is also a symbol of the complexity of the threat to Pakistan. The existing strategy to secure it has not worked, and all army chiefs have gone and vowed to establish peace in the province, and none have succeeded. Instructive, of course, of what is best left unsaid about the deep state and the militancy side by it. Ian Stephens, one of Pakistan's more empathic observers, wrote in his 1953 travelogue, Horned Moon, that Pakistani military officers, well, compared to Indians, possessed a, quote, intrinsic aptitude for leadership. Well, we know what that became after October 58. But less enamored than Stevens was Professor Hans Morgenthau, whose priceless prescience published on March 19, 1956, bears repetition now and always. Pakistan is not a nation and hardly a state. It has no justification in history, ethnic origin, language, civilization, or the consciousness of those who make up its population. Against whom and how is an army likely to fight which is built upon so tenuous a foundation. It is hard to see how anything but a miracle or else a revival of religious fanaticism will assure Pakistan's future." Close quote. Another perceptive American analyst, George Perkovich's 2011 study, Stop Enabling Pakistan's Dangerous Dysfunction, has clearly not received the wider readership it merits beyond those in Foggy Bottom. The United States continues bankrolling this failure. It has, from 47 to date, disbursed some 78 billion in largesse to keep afloat the house that Jinnah built. Its deep state housekeepers have taken care of the other bit, namely religious fanaticism. After all, it was ISI chief Lieutenant General Mahmoud Ahmad who wired funds via Saeed Sheikh, Daniel Pearl's kidnapper and murderer to Mohammed Atta, hijacker of American Airlines AA Flight 11, and first striker of the Twin Towers. Ahmad in Washington that September morning, as Lower Manhattan burnt,
was bluntly presented a list of demands some later hours later on cooperation to which he enthusiastically acquiesced, even to the surprise of Colin Powell, before consulting Musharraf. He was in Kabul within the month, stiffening the Taliban's spine against swapping bin Laden or succumbing to infidels. Ahmed and the ISI remain unmentioned in the 9-11 Commission report. He is, in fact, the smoking gun of 9-11. Ahmed's Indian counterpart, former RAW Director General Vikram Sood, recently observed, quote, nearly 70 years of a close US association with Pakistan has led to a Stockholm syndrome in the DC beltway, while the Pakistanis match it with their Munchausen syndrome, a situation where the affected person exaggerates or creates symptoms of illness to gain attention, sympathy, and treatment. Pakistan's deep state works on this principle to get the US to provide succor, which is then misused against India. It is true this mindset will not change easily, but it certainly will not through increased largesse." Close quote. The late Lawrence Ziring remarked about the deep state's military facade that Islamization reified what the Civil War of 71 had unleashed earlier, that Pakistan's soldiers were duty bound to save their religion, even if in the process it meant yielding Muslim soil. For as Christine Fair perceptively states, the army's ability to intervene in Pakistan's governance without immediate public outrage stems from its assumption, well rehearsed in public, that it is the preeminent guardian not only of Pakistan's foreign and domestic interests, but also of the nation's ideology variously constructed. And for the record, Pakistan's Sher Dil self-style guardians have had no qualms in yielding Muslim soil even before 71. On 2nd March 63, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, Pakistan's then foreign minister, inked the Sino-Pakistan Frontier Boundary Agreement, whereby it gifted 2,050 square miles of the Trans-Karakoram Shaksgam Valley Tract, historically part of the Kingdom of Shigar, which was aligned with Ladakh to Mao's China. The entire area in question, some 3,822 miles, is now administered by China as part of the Kashgar Prefecture of the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. That India disputed Pakistan's handling, handing over of disputed territory was inevitable. Nehru, by one estimate, put it at the ceding of some 13,000 square kilometers to China, including those parts of Xinjiang, which historically were culturally attached to Ladakh and Kashmir. Nobody questions why or how Pakistan did this, even as it goes about hosting Kashmir Solidarity Day annually on the 5th of February. And in 2009, Farhan Bukhari, writing in the Financial Times, pointed out that Pakistan has decided to parcel choice agricultural land to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. The Saudis, like the Emiratis, wish to guarantee themselves food, future food security. And they will be able to purchase farmlands on the open market from the private and public sector. Economists have warned that Pakistan must attend to its own domestic food shortages and maintain a contingency surplus while checking inflation of daily essentials. And now, all of Pakistan is open for sale, starting with Baluchistan, physically 43% of Pakistan, that largest province, but also the least linked emotively to the CPEC project, best summed up by Christine Fair as CPEC, colonizing Pakistan to enrich China. A glimpse of this next Monday will be available, ladies and gentlemen, on BBC Two, Dangerous Bo Boundaries, when Adnan Sarwar travels to the Khairi Azam Solar Park, a 6,500-acre farm in Pakistan's breadbasket, West Punjab. According to a leak report published in Pakistan's newspaper of record, Dawn, May 2017, land will be leased out to Chinese companies for establishing demonstration projects in irrigation technology and improved seed varieties. And 6,500 acres will be exclusively set aside for the Chinese to experiment uh, such high seed yields. Meat production, as well as milk demonstration plants, to say nothing of fruit juice and jam production factories, are also on the anvil. Churchill once remarked that there is no finer investment for a country than putting milk into babies. Coming generations of Chinese toddlers will have much to thank Madhuri Millat, Miss Fatima Jinnah. But who will assure and defend those lifelines of milk, jam, and juice for Chinese children? or safely transport Pakistani yarn and coarse cloth for Xinjiang's textile market? As the leak report also stated, that China can make the most of the Pakistani market in cheap raw materials so as to soak up surplus labor capital available in Xinjiang. Islamabad has agreed to the Chinese implementing a round-the-clock surveillance and video recordings of roads, marketplaces, highways, and plants, not to mention a pilot-safe city in Peshawar. They will, 
even if two proposed armored divisions by Beijing to be permanently stationed was turned down by Rahil Sharif before leaving for Riyadh. The Pakistan army deemed it too touchy over and above a question of pride, which led them to, quote, vow at any cost to protect the corridor with a new division of 17,280 troops, that is 22 additional wings of the forces. Quite right, given that the entire country is racked by instability of one sort or another, and both ends of the CPAC corridor are on slow burn mode. The northern areas, Gilgit Baltistan and Baluchistan, where Pakistan begins and ends. The Chinese will not tolerate any sabotage of their CPEC investment by disgruntled Muslim elements and refuse to distinguish the resentments of displaced, dissatisfied, despairing civilians, Baluchis, Baltids, Hunzais, Sindhis, Pashtuns, all those terror proxies sponsored and subvented by the military intelligence nexus. No tantrums confront the Chinese, unlike we Westerners, heretofore cajoling and bribing the Pakistan deep state to take out such extremists from destroying lives across Europe and North America. The CCP, Chinese Communist Party, is not going to be grilled back in their work as a paradise by ecologically conscious, globally attuned, pursed-lipped lefties over questions of forced rendition, black sites, and enhanced interrogative procedures. Those indignities affront radical chic capitalists, never card-carrying communists. Professor Bernard Lewis's gifted insights have always had something of the touch of revelation. He presently wrote in the New Yorker, November 2001, quote, sooner or later, Al-Qaeda and related groups will clash with the other neighbors of Islam, Russia, China, India, who may prove less squeamish than the Americans in using their power against Muslims and their sanctities, close quote. The Pakistan deep state ought to realize, sooner the better, that China will take a no-nonsense sledgehammer approach to any and every audacious outrage, imminent or actual, threatening its expatriates, project sites, and Marxist imperialist ambitions. It might be a blessing in disguise for New Delhi and Washington. The former makes no bones of its opposition to those projects across the disputed region of Azad Kashmir and the northern areas. Yet. China may just be able to keep the generals, ISI-trained death squads, and motley militant groups on a tight leash. Washington would be happy to see someone succeed where it has failed. Let the Chinese assume both responsibility and headache. Great powers should. And if the Chinese fancy themselves as one, then the dictum that with great power comes great responsibility could not be brought home to them a day sooner. And the Pakistanis better recall what the founder of that great power, Chairman Mao, famously stated, Power flows from the barrel of a gun, and they will give Pakistani rogue elements a mutor jawab to any and every threat. Thank you. Uh, most of my work um, over the last 25 years where I've been in and out of Pakistan and the rest of South Asia has been actually to engage with young people and to listen to voices on the ground. And those people who know what I've worked on has been a lot on national identity, which then morphed into arguments about citizenship and the relations of young people with regard to the state. And what I decided to do today is to give you um, a sort of snapshot of um, the book I'm co-authoring with Dr. Tanya Said at LUMS on uh, what young people think of the state today. Um, why is that important? Well, first of all, here you've got some quite old data. It's very difficult to get new data on um, the actual percentages of how many, how many young people there are. But in 2011, it was estimated that of the 180 million Pakistanis, almost 60% were below the age of 24, which means that the young people's voices are actually quite important. Um, the data below from Yusuf, but also some of the data from British Council, mirrored a lot of my sort of very much smaller uh, surveys that I did with young people in terms of the lack of confidence in public institutions, the highest being in the army and the lowest being in the national government. Um, and generally speaking, when you speak to young people, they aren't that bothered with politics, they are more bothered about the lack of electricity, the lack of water, the lack of employment, and increasingly, um, especially since 2009, I was living in Pakistan in 2009, I was uh, teaching at LUMS uh, about the issues pertaining to security and violence. These were really the sort of issues which started to come up increasingly as I was speaking to people. So um, I think there's nothing new here when I say that democracy doesn't seem to be the system of choice. So I differ slightly from what, Chris, uh, what Christine was saying earlier on. Um, and so the question is obviously why? Um, 
I did a, I was doing a survey before the last elections and I also was doing lots of focus groups um, before the last elections to find out what young people were saying and it was really, um, I spent a lot of time mainly in Karachi and Kachiabadis and then in rural Punjab going around um, in sort of secondary schools and colleges and, and universities and asking you know, what do you think about politics? Well, who will you vote for? And there was a lot of enthusiasm for Tariq and Saf and uh, Imran Khan and all of that was sort of, and then when you ask the young people, um, are you registered? Many said they were not. And that, th that distinction of actually having a, perhaps an enthusiasm about what's going on in politics and being able to follow what's going on on TV and uh, debates on Facebook and social media plays a huge role in all of this. But then the actual practical act of going and voting and being politically active and casting your ballot, those are not necessarily seen as connected. And as the answer, uh, so this data pack was from the British Council, they actually found something very similar, that a lot of people uh, a lot of young people actually were not registered. Um, it's very difficult to actually find out who will have cast their ballots because that data is held at TESIL level. So you'd have to go from TESIL to TESIL to actually find out how many young people voted. And that, no one, as, to my knowledge, no one has as yet done. So why the lack of um, enthusiasm when it comes to actual political participation, which is an essential part of democracy? Um, this is based on data that was collected uh, from 2009 onwards and has continued. But these themes will all be very, very familiar. So you know, the fact that there is too much corruption that you need family connections, that because of the violence, it's not safe to get involved in, in, in politics. A lot of young people I spoke to felt that they were helpless, um, that they didn't have a role model, and that actually their responsibilities were downwards to their families as opposed to being outwards to the country. So in the first instance, if the state isn't providing you with Bijli Pani and Makan, then you are the one who's supposed to res respond in that way and bring, make sure that the family has a meal on the table every day, and that's much more important than being part of uh, being politically active. Um, so there is... Beyond that, because people are living in Pakistan, which is, uh, uh, which is the life in Pakistan has become harder and harder, uh, there has been a disillusionment with, democ uh, with democracy and with politics in general. So what we heard more recently, so Dania and I went back into the field after the Peshawar incident um, in, uh, at the end of 2014 and did quite a lot of field work in 2015 and at the beginning of 2016. And more the themes which came out were more crystallized around why democracy cannot work. So a lot of things about we don't have the education, we don't have an educated population, so therefore votes are manipulated and democracy can't work.